Greetings and seasonal felicitations to all of you fellow time travellers. It's great to have you with me as we hurtle. Sometimes we move at a more sedate pace, but let's say we travel through history together. Um, I could do it on my own, but that would be so lonely, so it's lovely to have you with me. Uh, Reflecting on history is part of what keeps me rooted and sane, actually. The reassurance that comes from knowing that whatever madness is unfolding around us, a version of it has happened before. And it's when we make the comparisons between the past and the present that we prepare ourselves to deal with that present and even to contemplate the future to come. Before we get started, I have to thank, as always, those who show their commitment and their support for what Paul and I are doing here by uh, subscribing to the patreon.com presence. Uh, it's the financial support from there that makes possible the love letters and the, and the rest of uh, the content that we provide here. Uh, so if you're already a member, a thousand thanks. If you're not a member, but you're persuaded now to become a member of an ever-growing family, just go to patreon.com, look for me by name, follow the instructions. It's cheaper by the year, but you can also uh, pay monthly. Uh, see what decisions you'd like to make there but you join a a community, a family of like-minded curious types come aboard, you know you want to Okay, that's enough of the advert please now strap yourselves into the time machine as we set off for the next step on my love letter to the British Isles Cue the music There has been no other book in the English language that has had so much significance, so much impact. In this podcast, we're stepping foot into a building whose history is inextricably woven into the story of the British Isles. Camped beside it in 1944, General Dwight D. Eisenhower planned the D-Day landings. William Shakespeare and his troupe of actors performed in its great hall. Henry VIII's bloated and corrupt shadow falls darkly across its red bricks. And it's a place that gave birth to a book. And not just any book. A translation of the Hebrew and Greek texts whose poetic words, shapes and rhythms made it a cornerstone, the cornerstone, of English literature. The elegance of the humanity expressed within its pages helped empower the formation of modern democracy. The King James Bible. The best-selling book ever. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. In the last episode, we watched the mighty Spanish Armada being battered, beaten and destroyed near the Giant's Causeway. Where are we now? We're in a landmark building, as beautiful as it is beguiling. It's a des res, and it's played a part in much of the history that has unfolded in these isles. It's a place with panache, it's full of power and intrigue. We're on the banks of the Thames, with London in sight at the magnificent Hampton Court Palace. Along with, let's say, Westminster Abbey, which we talked about with the Wars of the Roses, and Lincoln Castle, which was our setting for talking about Magna Carta, there are certain places that are of interest to me because they're kind of like pinch points where lots of different stories of British history start out from all sorts of different directions, but there are certain sort of pinch points that a lot of them seem to pass through. Hampton Court Palace is another of those. It's one of those places that, in terms of British history, you start out with an individual or a story, and for for one reason or another, all sorts of different stories pass like threads through Hampton Court. It's one of those good places to go to kind of collect stories and to collect events. For example, next to Hampton Court is Bushy Park, which is adjacent to Hampton Court, and it's made up of land that was parkland that was brought together by Henry VIII as hunting grounds. 
But in 1944, it was where Dwight D. Eisenhower planned the D-Day landings in a tent amongst hundreds, thousands of tents. His was one of the tents that was in Bushy Park, and it was in there that he planned the reconquest to turn the tide of the Second World War. It's incredible that such an old building like this still has important threads of history running through it right up into the 20th century. Yeah, you know, when you're in the vicinity of it, it's because of where it sits, you know, it sits, it sits on the Thames, you know, and it's in the vicinity of London. And so almost inevitably, for at least 2,000 years, history of all sorts has been building up around London. You just can't help it. It's one of those places. It works like a magnet with iron filings. Events just cluster around it. In the late 1600s, the end of the 17th century, William and Mary, they employed Christopher Wren to transform what was a, a, a Tudor palace at the time into something more that fitted with them. William Shakespeare, who hasn't? Who in the, who in the universe hasn't heard of William Shakespeare? He was part of a company of actors called the King's Men and they performed in the Great Hall in Hampton Court Palace for uh, King James, King James VI of Scotland, first of England. William and Mary, Shakespeare, Dwight D. Eisenhower. But, but, if you're interested in British history, you inevitably are interested in King Henry VIII and the whole of that Tudor period that's so defining about English history. Well, it's Henry VIII's bloated, corrupted shadow that falls most darkly across the red brick of Hampton Court Palace. And so much of what people associate with him is connected there. He married Catherine Parr, that was his sixth and last wife, in the Chapel Royal at Hampton Court. So he got married for the last time in Hampton Court. And by then, so much of what he was already legendary for, notorious for, had also happened in Hampton Court. Edward, his only son, was born and baptised in Hampton Court. Edward was born to Jane Seymour, and she died in the palace three weeks after Edward was born. She didn't survive the birth. She lingered for three weeks and then died. He was in Hampton Court Palace when he divorced Anne of Cleves, and then he married his teenage wife, Catherine Howard, in Hampton Court Palace. There was a great age gap between them, and he found out after they were married that she hadn't been a virgin, which was a big deal at the time. And it, it would appear, or, or he certainly alleged, that she wasn't even faithful to him after they were married. And so he had her imprisoned in Hampton Court Palace. And there's a, a harrowing image. She escaped from her imprisonment for just a little while and she ran screaming through the corridors, calling out for him, desperate for him to take her back, save her, spare her life. And she didn't reach him, mostly because he didn't want her to and she was subsequently tried and, and executed. All of that Henry VIII-ness is there at, at Hampton Court. He didn't build it though, did he? No, he didn't. No, absolutely not, no. Um, I first encountered Hampton Court Palace as a member of the public. I went, I don't know, goodness me, um, 30 years ago, 20 odd years ago, as a visitor, just to see it. And it's what struck me at the time, I remember, was it actually looks like a palace. Buckingham Palace. It's just this grey office block of a thing. I dare say it's maybe got nicer parts of it, where the family and, and the rest have, have actually got access to, but the way the public see it, it's a fairly dour grey building. Others, you know, Edinburgh Castle, because I'm so affectionate about Stirling Castle where I live, which I think actually looks the part and has a Renaissance palace that was built by King James V and I think it looks the part. But Edinburgh Castle doesn't, it's just a big bleak tenement block. It just happens to sit up on top of a plug of volcanic rock and all the people park up and take photographs of it and visit it. But I often think if you looked at it objectively, it is a long way from being the most attractive place and it's certainly not somewhere you'd want to go and live. And so in London on the Thames, all the fabled locations, addresses that are were there for royalty, 
The only ones that survive, there's Windsor Castle, there's the Tower of London, which is on the Thames, but who would want to live in the Tower of London, given its miserable, dark history of, of torture and, and execution and all the rest of it? But Hampton Court Palace has panache. Its location, the sweep of the river beside it, and the look of it, it's glamorous. The gardens are a bit fussy for my taste. However, they are splendid. It was originally, it started as a property of the Knights Hospitaller, but it was acquired, it was, it was picked up in the 1500s by Cardinal Thomas Wolsey. He was a butcher's boy from Ipswich, but before too long he was a favourite of Henry VIII. Uh, he became Lord Chancellor, which is to say he was uh, the king's most powerful, most influential minister. And he built, he acquired the site, what had been the, this place that was o- occupied by the Knights Hospitaller, uh, and he built a first version of, of Hampton Court Palace. It was pretty splendid. But like everybody else, <laughs> Wolsey fell out with Henry VIII, probably not willingly, scenting his own blood in the water of the Thames flowing past his, his windows. And he gifted Hampton Court Palace to Henry in 1528 for all the good it did him, because he was dead two years later. But Henry, however much he'd liked Thomas Wolsey to begin with, and, and however he regarded him at the end, he always liked Hampton Court. It's in this lovely location. It's just the right sort of distance away from London itself. And it's on the river, which means that you've got this access by boat. It's perfect in many ways. It was Henry that commissioned the Great Hall that's there now with this amazing hammer beam roof. It's like looking up inside the structure, the skeleton of a timber boat. They're built without nails. It's all, it's all held together by, by clever carpentry. Apparently Henry was so intent on having the project completed the Great Hall and other additions and adjustments to Hampton Court that he insisted that the labourers work through the night. So it was working 24 hours a day, so guys were working on it in the dark by candlelight because Henry was so desperate and so keen to have the thing finished. But one of the things you recognise very early on is that he was a considerable king without a doubt, but he was hopeless at making babies. Which, when you get right down to it, or the right sort of babies, let's say, you know, when you get right down to it, that's the number one job of a king. Or indeed a queen. The Stuarts, the Scottish Stuarts, were fantastic at it. All of them. They were feckless, ineffectual, disastrous individuals. A lot of them. Most of them. They had all sorts of faults, but my goodness, they could knock out babies. They were all turning out 10 and 20 kids by their wives and illegitimate offspring by their various mistresses and all the rest of it. By the time the Stuarts were finished, Scotland was riddled with them. Which was why, in the end, it was a Stuart that succeeded to the English throne as well. Because the English kings and queens just couldn't get it together to provide heirs. They just couldn't do it in the same way. So, in the end, when Elizabeth I died, it was James VI and I the Stuart King of Scotland that acquired the English throne. That was the effect of the fecund nature of the, of the Stuart, of the Stuart Kings of Scotland. Well, Henry couldn't manage this. And his, his uh, serial inability to get himself the kind of strapping boys that he needed, that was what caused him to embark on his disastrous series of marriages and executions and divorces. His first wife was Catherine of Aragon. That was his big brother's widow. His big brother should have been king, should have reigned, but he died young. And in due course, Henry married his brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon. She was Spanish, but she didn't provide him with a male heir. They had Mary, who eventually became queen, but no no sons. So in his desperation, he, um, he divorced Catherine so that he could get hold of Anne Boleyn and try again for a male heir. One of those that was critical of Henry at that time was William Tyndall, who was, amongst other things, he was infamous as a translator of the Bible. Translating the Bible from out of the Greek and out of the Latin was a controversial business. And those who sought to put it into the English language got into trouble. Why? Well, it was in the interests of the priesthood. Because it was in Latin and most people couldn't understand it, it conveyed on the priesthood a certain power. If you wanted to hear the word of God, 
you needed a translator, basically, in between you and God. And so that gave the priesthood a certain power. And so the very idea of putting the word of God into the hands of scum like you and me <laughs> was, was controversial because it, it undermined the power of the church. But Tyndall, Tyndall was one of those who translated the Bible into English, but he was also critical at the same time of Henry VIII, and Henry had him hunted down. Tyndall was on the continent, and Henry had him singled out and hunted down as a heretic. He was captured on Henry's behalf by Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and in 1536, he was tried and executed for crimes that just sound ridiculous, really. Uh, and he was strangled to death, can you imagine? He was held against a post and then a, like a, a rope or, or a garrote around his neck, which was tightened until he could breathe no more. And legend has it that his last words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Let him see the things that he's doing wrong. And so that brings us into interesting territory in relation to Hampton Court Palace, because William Tyndall was not by any stretch of the imagination the first person to translate the Bible into English. Another character, uh, John Wycliffe, had produced at least at least one translation of the Bible into English in the 14th century, in the 1300s. Uh, and before that, other people had done it. But Tyndall's was different and significant because it was actually translated from the original Greek and Hebrew. So it, it was as close to the source as you could get. The biblical stories, when they were written down for the first time, having been oral, when they were written down at all, they were written down in Hebrew, and then they were translated into Greek. And so Tyndall's translation into English was regarded as particularly useful, particularly good, because he referred back to those original older languages. The situation changed. Despite the fact that Tyndall had been so persecuted for what he was doing, Henry commissioned a translation of the Bible. And it was called the Great Bible, not least because it was very big. <laughs> it was physically very large. You know, Henry was a big man and Hampton Court was a big palace and he commissioned and, and obtained for himself a big Bible. Now, the Bible, of all the stories, I said at, at, at the top that there were many stories that passed through Hampton Court, but I would allege that the, the brightest, the most significant thread that passes through Hampton Court is the Bible. Henry, he died rotten, corrupted in every way, corrupted spiritually and physically. He was a bloated, stinking, decaying wreck of a man, you know, by the time he finally gave up the ghost. And he was succeeded, first of all, by his son, his only son, Edward. But it didn't last. Edward was a, was a sickly boy, had never thrived. Uh, he died. Then Mary, who was the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, she succeeded. She was Catholic. She was married to Philip of Spain when he was prince. It was he who commissioned the Armada and sent it to invade England. But he was married to Mary, Catholic Mary, uh, Catherine of Aragon's daughter, Henry VIII's daughter. It was no love match. These people got married for uh, diplomatic and political reasons, but they still went through the motions. And Mary was pregnant. But it was a phantom pregnancy. It amounted to, well, who knows? Who knows? We don't have sort of modern medical evidence for what was actually going on there. But she was said to be pregnant, but then it didn't produce a child, nor was there a miscarriage. So it appears that it was some kind of false pregnancy. And given the superstition and the, and the, and the atmosphere of the times, she was fearful that she was being punished for tolerating Protestantism in England. She was Catholic, but the, the country had been, after Henry VIII, it had been turned towards what we would know as the Anglican faith or the Church of England. And Mary's on the throne as a Catholic, and she believes that God's punishing her for not completing the job of turning the country back to the true church as she understood it. So she set about persecuting Protestants, and she burned hundreds of them at the stake. This is where she gains her violent and ultimately tragic reputation. There was a second phantom pregnancy or false pregnancy that produced no offspring, 
A lot of historians and, and other specialists have looked back at her recorded symptoms and concluded that it was cancer. And she died. Whatever it was that wasn't a pregnancy, she died. So it's at that point, it's with Mary's death, Catholic Mary's death, that she's succeeded by Elizabeth I. She of the great speech at Tilbury Fort. And Elizabeth was Protestant. It was Elizabeth who went on to have the unbelievably su successful reign. She was adored, good Queen Bess. But like her father, for different reasons, she produced no offspring. You know, she was the Virgin Queen and she produced no heir. And she died in 1603. And it was at that point that she was succeeded by James VI of Scotland, the Stuart, he of the, he of the fecund, uniquely fertile royal family. He was 37 when he came to the throne, and you can imagine the febrile atmosphere as he travelled down from Scotland. I mean, goodness me, there's a, a Scottish, a Scottish king is now going to be the King of England too. You can imagine what that was like. The excitement and the and the agitation and the and the criticism and the controversy that there was around it. James was christened Catholic because his mother was Mary Queen of Scots, and his, his christening was by Catholic rites, but he was raised. He was raised and lived as a Protestant. And he was devout. And he was very interested in matters theological. You know, he could argue theology with the best of them. And so, by the time he arrives in England to take up the throne, all sorts of English Christians were interested to see which way the wind was blowing. Who's he going to favour? Because, you know, within, within the English... Uh, within England, there, were, there was more than one flavour of Christianity floating about. As things turned out, it was Puritans that were the first to get to him. And they handed him a document called the Millinery Petition, which, um, amongst other things, it suggested that the best way ahead for the new king was to have a conference among the learned. You know, let's all get together. Quite modern, actually. Let's all, let's all meet, all of us religious types, and thrash it out and find a way ahead for us all as a Christian nation. This resulted in a conference, the Hampton Court Conference, that was held in, in January 1604. It was loud and it was chaotic and all sorts of factions and everybody was there with a strong opinion and there was a lot of tension and anxiety about which way the king would lean and which version of Christian worship that King James would favour. In the end, it was a lot of loud noise and a lot of hot air and not much decided. They didn't actually get much accomplished in terms of reforming religion. The Puritans had been keen to get rid of bishops. There was always opposition in some camps to the presence of bishops, these figures that interceded between man and God. Bishops were powerful in their own right, and the Puritans were, were one but not the only group that would have seen the back of them. But James, for his own reasons, decided that bishops were, were all right. But what he did do, and the only thing that really was of any significance that came out of that conference, was that James decreed that there would be a new translation into English of the Bible. And it was that decision that gave rise, 11 years later, because that's how long it took, to the King James Bible. Which is also called the authorised version, the KGB, the King James Bible, For people that have Bibles, even if they're not religious, but they've somehow acquired a Bible from their parents or their grandparents, the chances are it's the King James Version. And I say it's the brightest thread running through Hampton Court Palace because the KJB, the authorised version, the King James Bible, is the cornerstone of English literature and the English language itself. English literature, the works of William Shakespeare, the way we speak to each other day to day would not be as it is had it not been for the King James Bible. It was a massive undertaking. It took 11 years. It was, it was commissioned in 1604 and it took 11 years to put it together. There were probably 54 scholars who worked on it during that time. Uh, and they referred to Tyndall, they referred to Wycliffe, all the previous translations, as they sought to uh, to put together the, the you know the ultimate Bible. Amongst other things that's wonderful about it, it was composed to be read out loud. 
you know, for most people would still need to have the Bible read to them. Whether it was in English or not, you know, most congregations would need to have it read. And so great effort was put into ensuring that the, the King James Bible sounded good. The final edit of the finished piece was done in the Jerusalem Chamber in Westminster Abbey. But then it was in Stationer's Hall in the vicinity of St Paul's Cathedral that the thing was read aloud. It took a year to, to read this thing so that they could decide that the flow of it, that the flow of it worked the cadences and the rhythms and you know I always think about it you know I think about the fact that it was about flow and I think about how it, it seems fitting because the original idea for that bible came at Hampton Court Palace with the flow of the Thames beside it that endless powerful flow that cannot be resisted and there's something very fitting to me that the creation of a translation of the Bible that was put together very much to be read aloud, to have flow, was conjured into being by the River Thames. Why is it so influential? Everyone is affected by the King James Bible, religious or not. There are countless scores, hundreds of everyday phrases that that hadn't previously existed, but that were coined and conjured into being for the King James Version of the Bible. And it's phrases like rise and shine, the powers that be, the apple of his eye, a man after his own heart, signs of the times. Now these are things that people say, they're cliches, but they didn't exist until they were put together for the King James Version of the Bible. And in every way it was influential. It informed and shaped the speeches and, and certainly the thinking of William Wilberforce, MP for Hull, who was so instrumental in Parliament in securing the end of slavery. He was a, a kind of, a, you'd call him a born-again Christian, and it was the cadences and the rhythms and the language of the King James Bible that informed the speeches he made that were so significant in doing away with or, or starting to address the stain of slavery. Because it was translated into that wonderful form of English, it went on to inform great ideas. And so modern democracy around the world, some of the language of it and the thinking of it is shaped by the language of the King James Bible. So as well as helping to do away with slavery, it was also there in the emancipation of women. It crossed the Atlantic. It was there in the language and the thinking and the speechifying about the foundations of the United States of America. It's absolutely a foundation document. The shape of, of Western liberal democracy, so many of the freedoms and the acts of humanity and the insistence on the importance of the individual, they found some of their momentum and some of their power in the language of the King James Version of the Bible. There has been no other book in the English language that has had so much significance, so much impact. It has been the best-selling book in the English language. People who are not of a religious frame of mind can be dismissive of the Bible. And in, in the modern secular world, the, the Bible sometimes gets a, a bit of a bad rap because it contains in it ideas and thinking that f for many people are anachronistic, archaic, and so out of date. But the truth of it is to overlook the significance of the Judeo Christian foundations of Western civilization. To seek to dismiss that is to make one of the fundamental errors. You know, in the last 2,000 years, there has been no greater influence on the structure of civilization in our part of the world than the Judeo Christian model. And since its creation in the 17th century, the King James Version of the Bible has been part of the way in which that message and that wisdom and that determination to find a better way has resonated throughout the world. And there has been no finer iteration of the language, of the thinking, of the Bible than the, the authorised version, the King James Version of the Bible. And it came to be, it's in existence because of a conference that was held in January 1604 in Hampton Court Palace by the Thames.
conjured and conceived in a festering cesspit of stink and suffering. Magical words and language that has moved and shaped the whole world. Poetry side by side with pestilence, poverty, great wealth and riches. A writer who entertained the throng, a towering figure of literature striding through the city. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles. To help support this podcast, which is and always will be free, and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. I'd love to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. And please write a review of this week's podcast and share it with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's love letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music's by Malcolm Goldie. The social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is taken care of by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And a special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF podcast production.